Thank I'm happy you to much. have you here. Thank you. Um, and I, yeah, I appreciate that you're guest, first guest in our show. When have you last been to Berlin? I was last year about six years ago. Um, no, seven years ago. 2010, I came to Berlin and there were a group of German activists from all different organisations held a conference and they were talking about the Euro, the European Union, Germany, the future, where it was all going. And I came and gave a speech here and I said that what Germany really needed was a Eurosceptic political movement. Not just one that wrote papers and did blogs, but one that actually contested elections. Um, and I said that uh, people around Europe who are concerned about the direction of the project and what it means for democracy and for the whole concept of nation state need not feel alone because there's lots of us in every country feeling like it. So that was my last visit to Berlin. Seven years ago. Seven years ago. So high time to come back. Uh, well, yeah, not only high time to come back, because it's a great place to come to, but, but also uh, what pleases me is that I come back and I find someone like you is putting themselves before the electorate. So whether my visit made any difference or not, I don't know, but I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so what we learned from you uh, is that there is a Brexit now. There wouldn't have been any Brexit without uh, UKIP. There wouldn't have been any UKIP without you. So one can say you're responsible um, for Brexit. Oh, I'm responsible for many things. I mean, according to Hillary Clinton, I'm responsible for Donald Trump as well. Climate so, change. <laughs> what do you blame everything on me, really? No, I mean, look, you know, I was, I was in business for 20 years. You know, I was never, ever going to be in politics. I was in business for 20 years. I was in the metals industry. So there are very few places in the Ruhr and the Rhineland that I didn't visit at some point over those 20 years. So I know all about business in Europe and I think there's no question that the interlinkages that we've built up since 1945 right across Europe, you know, where we've got rid of barriers to trade and, 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 and money can flow more freely, I think all of that's been to the good and I, and I think in many ways it's bettered the lives of tens of millions of people. And I, I never ever came at this from, you know, an anti-European perspective. I mean, I mean I've, worked, I've worked for French companies, uh, married a girl that came from Hamburg. I mean, you know, I'm not anti-European and I get very upset when people try to say this, but, and I do feel this today more strongly than ever, what might have started out as a very good idea uh, post-war reconciliation and you know they're the roots of the project that if people sit down together and break bread together and trade together they're going to become friendlier well yeah absolutely and you know nobody in their right minds uh, could think that wasn't a good idea but now what you've got is you've got Brussels you've got an organization full of tens of thousands of people earning far too much money with the best pensions in the world and this has become about them it's no longer about reconciliation between countries, and it certainly isn't about the well-being of ordinary people. Have you, I mean, you've been fighting for something like 17 years within the European Parliament yeah. to achieve what you achieved. Um, you were basically fighting the world. Um, so what is the source of your strength? Where, what is giving you the energy? I, I, I goodness only knows. Um, a touch of madness, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, it's funny, isn't it? You, you, you can embark upon something in life and Everyone tells you you're wrong, you're crazy, you're mad, you'll never succeed. And it sort of makes you more determined. Um, I, I think in my case, just perhaps, I was a little personal answer to the question. You know, I mean, I survived a massive road traffic accident. I was very lucky to survive. I had a very serious illness. And I came out of an aeroplane crash, which, if I look today at the footage, I think, well, how, do, how on earth? Did I get out of that? I think perhaps sometimes when you have, you know, really extraordinary experiences like that, you kind of think, do you know what? I don't really care what people think anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. This is, I think this is what, what uh, must be the case. Otherwise, you, mm. you would not survive uh, politically or, or physically. Um, as you've been going that way the whole time in one direction, has there been a moment where you really doubted that you would succeed? No. Not one minute? No. Never. Never. Do you know, I took the view from early on that whatever was said in Westminster, in, in, in London, whatever was said in the national press, people who drink in my pub in my village in Kent 
don't think like that. And I could see 25 years ago there was a complete divide between what ordinary people wanted out of this and what the political class wanted out of this. And the sort of, if you like, the test bed for me was something called the exchange rate mechanism. And we joined the exchange rate mechanism in 1990, and that was stage two of monetary union, stage three being joining the euro. Yeah. So we pegged effectively what we did is we pegged our currency to the Deutschmark. Now, I'd done enough business in Germany to realize that the British economies and German economies are totally different. Yours more based on manufacturing, ours more based on service, ours more based on global trade, yours, more, yours more, far more heavily based on continental trade. Or, and or I, trade and I, with UK. <laughs> well, as it turns out, and we'll come to that in a minute, I'm sure. But, and I could see that, that if you peg two currencies to each other with countries that operate at different stages of the economic cycle. So I predicted in 1990 it would be a disaster. And here we are. Uh, and, and, but funny, isn't it? In a way, thank goodness, we did join the exchange rate mechanism because if we hadn't had that horrible lesson, we too would have been part of the euro as well. Okay. Let's come to Brexit and the European mm. uh, Union. Imagine yourself being responsible for putting reforms to the European Union um, and handed over the, the power by Juncker or whomever. Uh, how would you reform the European no, no, Union, no, 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 if, no, no. if ever? No, 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 no. There are no reforms. There are no reforms. If, if you could design them, if it there would are you... no reforms. <laughs> this is what Look, we know. I'm a veteran. You've just started in this. I've been watching this right for two and a half decades. There was a moment that the European Union could have reformed. And it was when the former French president, Giscard d'Estaing, had his constitutional convention to decide what was the future of the European project. Because, you know, Mitterrand, Kohl and Delors had pushed it towards this direction of more political unification, the euro and everything else. But the big moment to decide, you know, 2002, 3, uh, when they were sitting down deciding what's the future of Europe. And, and this will surprise you really surprise you. I said that this is the one opportunity you've got to democratise the European project, to try and build a relationship between it and the ordinary voters in the country. They decided, no, we want none of that. We will stick with the, the Monet method, as it's known, namely, and I think it's very important that people understand this, every single European law it gets proposed by an unelected European Commission who cannot be removed. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, that we've gone backwards that far. So that was the moment that it could have been reformed. It wasn't reformed. And if you listen, if you listen to what is being said today by Juncker, uh, by Tajani from the European Parliament, by Tusk from the European Council, and indeed Merkel, Macron, what they're all arguing for is deeper centralization and taking yet more power out of the hands of the individuals. And I think that to, <laughs> to argue that it can be reformed, it, it, frankly, it's like offering someone fool's gold. You know, it's a very glittery, lovely idea, but it isn't going to happen. And that was why, for us, faced with the end, it, it, you know, in the end, faced with that choice, we chose Brexit. You chose Brexit a year mm. ago. Mm. Um, so that was uh, the referendum date, basically the 23rd of June. Oh, yes. Um, so it's over a year ago. To be known forever after as Independence <laughs> Day. As Independence yes, Day. Absolutely. Thank you. We're grateful for that. <laughs> um, and what is what you see, what is the, the uh, situation at the moment, one year after? How, how would you <coughs> well, okay. comment on that? You know, what does Brexit really mean? What, are, what is the UK saying with Brexit? Very simply, we're saying we do not wish to be part of political union. But we are more than happy to have close trade relationships, to have reciprocal agreements, to have student exchanges, to do, uh, to tackle uh, cross-border crime, pollution, all of those things. You know, we, are, we, we want to be a very responsible next-door neighbour. I know there's a bit of water between us, but, you know, we're still relatively close and we want to be a responsible neighbour. We want to play a full role with our European friends. And, you know, we do. And logic says that the European Union should recognise a sovereign democratic will of the British people and respect it. They don't. 
then that's a closer democracy. Well, general. that's the point, isn't it? I mean, you get sort of Mr. Verhofstadt, who's the <laughs> European Parliament's chief negotiator, deplores the decision. Uh, Mr. Juncker's right hand man, Martin Selmar, said last week the British people are stupid. Well, you know, we're not very keen on being talked to like this. Um, and, and that's getting in the way of something that I think is more important and more relevant to a German audience. And, he, and you know, here it is. The fact is that for Germany, the United Kingdom is a crucial marketplace. We have a trade imbalance with you of about 30 billion euros every year. And in some years, it's even bigger than that. There are 1.3 million jobs in Germany directly related to products that are sold into the British marketplace. So this stuff kind of matters. Where Brexit goes from here matters to people working in Bavaria and the German car industry or whatever it may be. Now, we're the ones that are buying more from you than you are from us, and we're the ones saying, OK, let's just continue as we are. We're perfectly happy to have no tariffs, not to have those barriers, and to go on doing business. And my guess is, my guess is that if we spoke to German companies and German workers and probably the German trade unions, they would say, yeah, do you know what? This kind of makes sense. And yet, we have the election campaign going on. You had the head-to-head -to -head last week between Angela Merkel and my close friend Martin Schulz. And 20 million people watch it. And this doesn't even get discussed. So there is a real issue here. And, and I, I think there is sort of almost a conspiracy of silence amongst, uh, amongst the two front contenders in Germany over this issue. You know, they'd rather not be embarrassed about the European dimension in this campaign. But ultimately, Germany is the biggest, strongest country in Europe, and Merkel, without doubt, with the most influential voice of any member state. She could, if she, I assume she's going to be re-elected, she could do something on behalf of the whole of Europe and make Germany very popular. Make she Germany could. great again. Well... <laughs>
uh, there is a, you know, a large degree of economic competence and surety about Merkel. During the crisis, back in 08, you know, the reason that Germany rose to become the strongest force in the European project is that, frankly, the people that were running it, and in those days it was people like Mr. Broso, the former Portuguese communist, uh, I mean, they were so low calibre that she did rise through that and showed, in a crisis, a degree of economic surety. However, with her uh, warm, loving embrace of the euro, I think at some point down the road, Germany is going to be in for a very terrible shock. Because whilst you may be the richest in Europe, and whilst you may enjoy you know, comparatively good terms of trade with the rest of Europe, particularly good with us, um, the point is that at, at some point, there could be a bust, and it could come in Italy or a country like that. And at some point in time, you know, the Germans are going to be owed a very, very large sum of money by Mediterranean countries that in the end won't be able to pay it. So, as I say, on the face of it, Mrs Merkel has been very competent. I wonder in 10 years' time what people will really think. Yeah, I think we will have that debate uh, starting as of from now, maybe, hopefully. Uh, there's one other point I wanted to touch is uh, talking about uh, Germany and German history. Um, at school, what, what even the, the smallest learn already is that the European Union is, uh, means basically peace mm -hmm. and, and fortune um, and everything like that. And so if you're a good German, you have to be in favour of the European Union. Do you think that for the reason of our history, we're, we're a force to stick to the European Union. We have to support it because of German's history? Well, well Germany has a, a difficult relationship with its modern history for fairly obvious and straightforward reasons. Um, but uh, I think you have at some point in time to examine uh, what that proposition means, is that the European Union means peace. Well, does it mean that it stopped Germany invading again across the Rhine? Was post-1945 Germany going to be a military threat to anybody? No. In a sense, it's quite an insulting proposition, isn't it? It's actually saying we have to have this European Union to protect Germany from itself. And I think it's a nonsense. I don't think there's, there is zero prospect of Germany being an aggressive nation post-1945. Also, I would point people to that thinking that took place in 1920 with regards to the Balkans. You know, here we had a whole series of small states battling with each other for territory, um, shooting an archduke, leading to a catastrophic chain of events. And everybody in 1920, ah, we've got the solution. What we'll do is we'll take away their national identities, we'll put them all together, we'll give them one currency, one leader, one flag, one anthem, one police force, one army, we'll call it Yugoslavia, it'll be peace forever. Well, you know, in the last 25 years... It didn't really work out. It's broken down with catastrophic consequences. And I think the important thing for people to really understand is this, that mature democratic nation-states never go to war with each other. Never go to war with each other. It's where there is an absence of democracy or a breakdown of democracy that these things go wrong. And so if there is a lesson, if there's a real lesson to be drawn for all of us from what's happened in the last 150 years, it is that provided states, provided states are controlled by the people and the leaders can be sacked <laughs> at the next election, that that actually is the recipe for Europe going forward and, and, and ultimately for peace. Yeah. Let's shift again and, and uh, shortly talk about UKIP. Um, so UKIP started off in 1993, yeah. um, years ago. Um, can you tell me a bit about the beginning? What was the biggest problem? Do you remember those days? Oh, remember them? I was in the room. I mean, I was there Well, we founded it. I mean, I was the youngest person in the room by 20 years, I think. And I was the baby, you know. And Well, obviously, um, we have an electoral system in the United Kingdom that makes it just almost impossible for parties uh, to, to, to come into politics and break through. We've had, uh, over the last few decades, hundreds of attempts to set up new parties and they've all failed. So the early days of, of UKIP really were uh, very much the triumph of, 
of optimism <laughs> over, over reality. Um, the difficulties were, in, uh, our difficulties, quite interesting actually, there is, I mean, there is a bit of a parallel to the, way, to the way the AFD got started, in that the first leader that we chose was a university professor. And he's a clever bloke, and he could write good articles and give, give good lectures, but you know, if you asked him to boil an egg, he probably wouldn't know what he was doing. He wasn't very practical. So, <coughs> excuse me, we struggled with that. Uh, we found that hard. And I think like all new political movements, you know, you go through a series of splits and difficulties. Um, and, and so it was hard. It took a very long time to get off the ground. But here's the delicious irony. The delicious irony is the way that UKIP did get off the ground was in elections to the European Parliament. Yeah, that's the irony of history. Because they were the first set, because they were the first set of elections contested with, with a degree. And it has a different system. So it's you, a proportional, yeah, proportional system. Proportional system. You know, that makes a difference. And it's funny, you know, I mean, I'm looking at, looking at your party's prospects in these elections, and it's you know, very significant that, that we're going to get, you know, a voice of criticism and scepticism is going to get into the Bundestag with a good number of seats. And there was us, UKIP, the last general election. How many seats do you have in there? Four million votes. Four million votes, zero seats. And one seat. One, one, one <laughs> you know. so, so it's been very difficult. Yeah. Very, very difficult. Um, but as I say, ironically, the European system. You succeeded. We succeeded. And, 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 and what we did was we, we shifted the centre of gravity of the national debate. We took subjects that nobody would talk about. We took subjects that it, well, people thought uh, it was uh, embarrassing to talk about or even extreme to talk about. And we took those subjects and we put them right at the centre of the national debate. And if I, you know, and quite honestly, if I look back on that, it was, it was quite an achievement. It wasn't easy because when you take on the establishment, uh, you know, they come at you very viciously. It's, you know, it's, it's been, at times very nasty, but hey, it's been worth it. Time is nasty, so this is my last question. Um, you're known that you're close to Donald Trump. Tell us what is his current situation? Where is he in? Well, Trump was elected making a series of promises, uh, and he wants to do his best to fulfill that series of promises. Uh, the difficulty is that whatever he does, he gets obstructed by judges, he gets obstructed by members of his own party in Congress, and I think in many ways it's been very frustrating for him. Very, very frustrating for him. You know, I know, I know this guy well enough to tell you that he absolutely wants to hold faith with his electorate. Isn't it refreshing? A politician <laughs> who actually it's wants to do yeah. what he was elected yeah. to do. I mean, wow! Um, I tell you what, he's one tough guy. He's one very, very tough guy, and you can read wall-to-wall -wall criticism of him in the media or whatever it is, uh, but he will do what he thinks is right. Ultimately, he is going to need to get some support from his own party. There are some fences, I think, there that do need to be mended. I think, I mean, I will say this to you, I think the most important thing now for Trump is that he gets tax reform through Congress, uh, and if he does that, and if tens of billions of dollars flow back into America, which are sitting off, which are sitting overseas, he'll be able then to do, to do his infrastructure program. Uh, you know, frankly, I think, given the opposition uh, that's been shown to him, I, I think he's doing remarkably well. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you for coming.